This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 13, 2006. Country of the Pointed Furs by Sarah Orne Jewett. Chapter 8 Green Island. One morning, very early, I heard Mrs. Todd in the garden outside my window. By the unusual loudness of her remarks to a passer-by, and the notes of a familiar hymn which she sang as she worked among the herbs, and which came as if directed purposely to the sleepy ears of my consciousness, I knew she wished I would wake up and come and speak to her. In a few minutes she responded to a morning voice from behind the blinds, I expect you're going up to your schoolhouse to pass all this pleasant day. Yes, I expect you're going to be dreadful busy, she said despairingly. Perhaps not, said I. Why, what's going to be the matter with you, Mrs. Todd? For I suppose that she was tempted by the fine weather to take one of her favorite expeditions along the shore pastures to gather herbs and simples, and would like to have me keep the house. "'No, I don't want to go nowhere by land,' she answered gaily. "'No, not by land. "'But I don't know as we'll have a better day all the rest of the summer "'to go out to Green Island and see Mother. "'I waked up early thinking of her, the wind's light northeast. "'Twill take us right straight out at this time of year, "'and it's liable to change round to the southwest "'and fetch us home pretty long late in the afternoon. "'Yes, it's going to be a good day.' "'Speak to the captain and the Belden boy, if you see anybody going toward the landing,' said I. "'We'll take the big boat.' "'Oh, my sakes! Now you just let me do things my way,' said Miss Todd scornfully. "'No, dear, we won't take no big boat. I'll just get a handy dory, and Johnny Bowden and me'll manner ourselves. I don't want no abler boat in a good dory, and a nice light breeze ain't gonna make no sea, and Johnny's my cousin's son.' "'Mother'll like to have him come along, and he'll be down to the airing weirs all the time we're there anyway. "'We don't want to carry no men-folk, having to be considered every minute. "'No, you just let me do. We'll just slip out and see Mother by ourselves. "'I guess what breakfast you'll want's about ready now.' "'I had become well acquainted with Miss Todd as a landlady, herb-gatherer, and rustic philosopher— we had been discreet fellow-passengers once or twice when I had sailed up the coast to a larger town than Dunnet Landing to do some shopping, but I was yet to become acquainted with her as a mariner. An hour later we pushed off from the landing in the desired dory. The tide was just on the turn, beginning to fall, and several friends and acquaintances stood alongside the dilapidated wharf and cheered us by their words and evident interest. Johnny Bowden and I were both rowing in haste to get out where we could catch the breeze and put up the small sail which lay clumsily furled along the gunwale. Miss Todd sat aft, a stern and unbending lawgiver. "'You'd better let her drift. We'll get there bout as quick. The tide'll take her right out from under these old buildings. There's plenty wind outside.' "'Your boat ain't trimmed proper, Miss Todd!' exclaimed a voice from shore. "'You're loaded so the boat'll drag, and you can't get her before the wind, ma'am. "'You set midships, Miss Todd, and let the boy hold the sheet and the steer after she gets the sail up. "'You won't never get out to Great Island that way. She's loaded bad, your boat is. "'She's heavy behind she is now.' Mrs. Todd turned with some difficulty and regarded the anxious adviser. My right oar flew out of the water, and we seemed about to capsize. "'That you, Asa? Good morning,' she said politely. "'I always like the starn seat best, when you get back up from the country.' This allusion to Asa's origin was not lost upon the rest of the company. We were some little distance from shore, but we could hear a chuckle of laughter, and Asa, a person who was too ready with his criticism and advice on every possible subject, turned and walked indignantly away. When we caught the wind, we were soon on our seaward course, and only stopped to underrun a trawl, for the floats of which 
Mrs. Todd looked earnestly, explaining that her mother might not be prepared for three extra to dinner. It was her brother's trawl, and she meant to run her eye along for the right sort of little haddock. I leaned over the boat's side with great interest and excitement while she skillfully handled a long line of hooks and made scornful remarks upon worthless bait-consuming creatures of the sea as she reviewed them and left them on the trawl or shook them off into the waves. At last we came to what she pronounced a proper haddock, and, having taken him aboard and ended his life resolutely, we went on our way. As we sailed along, I listened to an increasingly delightful commentary upon the islands, some of them barren rocks, or at best giving sparse pasturage for sheep in the early summer. On one of these an eager little flock ran to the water's edge and bleated at us so affectingly that I would willingly have stopped. But Mrs. Todd steered away from the rocks and scolded at the sheep's mean owner, an acquaintance of hers, who grudged the little salt and still less care which the patient creatures needed. The hot midsummer sun makes prisons of these small islands that are a paradise in early June, with their cool springs and short thick growing grass. On a larger island, further out to sea, my entertaining companion showed me with glee the small houses of two farmers who shared an island between them, and declared that for three generations the people had not spoken to each other even in times of sickness or death or birth. When the news came that the war was over, one of them knew it a week, and never stepped across his wall to tell the other, she said. There, they enjoy it. They've got something to interest them in in such a place. Tis a good deal more tryin' to be tied to folks you don't like than tis to be alone. Each of them tell the neighbors their wrongs. Plenty's like to hear and tell again. Them as fetch a bone'll carry one, and they keep the fight a-goin'. I must say I like the variety myself. Some folks washes Monday and irons Tuesday the whole year round, even if the circus is goin' by. A long time before we landed at Green Island we could see the small white house standing high like a beacon, where Mrs. Todd was born, and where her mother lived, on a green slope above the water, with dark spruce woods still higher. There were crops in the fields which we presently distinguished from one another. Mrs. Todd examined them while we were still far at sea. Mother's late potatoes looked backward. Ain't had enough rain so far, she pronounced her opinion. They looked weedier than what they call Front Street down to Cowper Center. I expect Brother William is so occupied with his errand weirs and serving out bait to the schooners that he don't think one day of the land. What's the flag for above the spruces? There, behind the house, I inquired with eagerness. Oh, that's the sign for Aaron, she explained kindly, while Johnny Bowden regarded me with contemptuous surprise. When they get enough for schooners, they raise that flag, and when tis a poor catch in the weir pocket, they just fly a little signal down by the shore, and then the small boats come and get enough over for their trawls. There, look, there she is. Mother sees us. She's waving something out the door. She'll be down to the landing place quick as we are. I looked, and could see a tiny flutter in the doorway, but a quicker signal had made its way from the heart on shore to the heart on sea. "'How do you suppose she knows it's me?' said Mrs. Todd, with a tender smile on her broad face. "'There, you never get over being a child long as you have a mother to go to. Look at the chimney now. She's gone right in and brightened up the fire. Well, there, I'm glad my mother's well. You'll enjoy seeing her very much.' Mrs. Todd leaned back into her proper position, and the boat trimmed again. She took a firmer grasp of the sheet, and gave an impatient look at the gaff and the leech of the little sail, and twitched the sheet, as if she urged the wind like a horse. There came at once a fresh gust, and we seemed to have doubled our speed. Soon we were near enough to see a tiny figure with a handkerchiefed head come down across the field and stand waiting for us at the cove above a curve of the pebble beach. Presently the dory grated on the pebbles, and Johnny Bowden, who had been kept in abeyance during the voyage, sprang out and used manful exertion to haul us up with the next wave so that Mrs. Todd could make a dry landing. 
"'You've done that very well,' she said, mounting to her feet, and coming ashore somewhat stiffly, but with great dignity, refusing our outstretched hands, and returning to possess herself of a bag which had lain at her feet. "'Well, mother, here I be,' she announced with indifference. But they stood and beamed at each other's faces. "'Lookin' pretty well for an old lady, ain't she?' said Mrs. Todd's mother, turning away from her daughter to speak to me. She was a delightful little person herself, with bright eyes and an affectionate air of expectation like a child on a holiday. You felt as if Mrs. Blackett were an old and dear friend before you let go her cordial hand. We all started together up the hill. "'Now don't you haste too fast, mother,' said Mrs. Todd, warningly. "'Tis far reach horizon ground to that four-door, and you will set and get your breath once you're theirs, but go trotting about. Now don't you go a mite faster than we proceeded with this bag and basket. Johnny there, I'll fetch up the haddock. I just made one stop to underrun William's trawl till I came to just such a fish that I thought you'd want to make one of your nice chowders of. I've brought an onion with me that was laying about on the window-sill at home. That's just what I was wanting, said the hostess. I give a sigh when you spoke of chowder knowing my onions was out. William forgot to replenish us last time he was to the landing. Don't you haste yourself up, all Mary, on this rising ground. I hear you commence to wheeze already. This mild revenge seemed to afford a great pleasure to both giver and receiver. They laughed a little, and looked at each other affectionately, and then at me. Mrs. Todd considerately paused, and faced about to regard the wide sea view. I was glad to stop, being more out of breath than either of my companions, and I prolonged the halt by asking the names of the neighboring islands. There was a fine breeze blowing, which we felt more there on the high land than when we were running before it in the dory. "'Why, this ain't that kitten I saw when I was out here last.' "'The one that I said didn't appear likely?' explained Mrs. Todd as we went our way. "'That's the one, I'll marry,' said her mother. "'She's always had a likely look to me, and she's right after business. "'I never seen such a mouser for one of her age. "'If it weren't for William, I'd never should have housed the entire droning old thing so long. "'But he sets by her on account of her having a bobtail. I don't deem it advisable to maintain cats just on account of their having bobtails, but they're like all other such curiosities, good for them that wants to see em twice. The kitten catches mice for both, and keeps me respectable, as I hain't been for a year. She's a real understanding little elf, this kitten is. I picked her up from among five Miss Augusta Purnell had over to Burnt Island, said the old woman, trudging along with the kitten close at her skirts. Augusta, she says to me, why, Miss Blackett, you've took the omeliest, and says I, I've got the smartest, and I'm satisfied. I'd trust nobody sooner than you to pick out a kitten, mother, said the daughter handsomely, and we went on, in peace and harmony. The house was just before us now, on a green level that looked as if a huge hand had scooped it out of a long green field we had been ascending. A little way above, the dark spruce woods began to climb up the top of the hill and cover the seaward slopes of the island. There was just room for the small farm and the forest. We looked down at the fish house and its rough sheds, and the weirs stretching far out into the water. As we looked upward, the tops of the firs came sharp against the blue sky. There was a great stretch of rough pasture land round the shoulder of the island to the eastward and there were all the thick-scattered gray rocks that kept their places, and the gray backs of many sheep that forever wandered and fed on the thin, sweet pasturage that fringed the ledges and made soft hollows and strips of green turf like glowing velvet. The air was very sweet. One could not help wishing to be a citizen of such a complete and tiny continent and home of fisher folk. The house was broad and clean, with a roof that looked heavy on its low walls. It was one of the houses that seem firm-rooted in the ground, as if they were two-thirds below the surface, like icebergs. The front door stood hospitably open, in expectation of company, and an orderly vine grew at each side, 
but our path led to the kitchen door at the house end, and there grew a mess of gay flowers and greenery, as if they had been swept together by some diligent garden broom into a tangled heap. There were portulacas all along the lower step and straggling off into the grass, and clustering mallows that crept as near as they dared like poor relations. I saw the bright eyes and brainless little heads of two half-grown chickens who were snugged down among the mallows, as if they had been chased away from the door more than once, and expected to be again. "'It seems kind of formal coming in this way,' said Mrs. Todd impulsively, as we passed the flowers and came to the front doorstep. But she was mindful of the proprieties, and walked before us into the best room on the left. "'Why, Mother, if you haven't gone, turn the carpet!' she exclaimed, with something in her voice that spoke awe and admiration. "'When'd you get to it? I suppose Miss Attic's come over and helped you from White Island Landing?' "'No, she didn't,' answered the old woman, standing proudly erect and making the most of a great moment. "'I done it all myself, with William's help. He had a spare day and took right hold with me, and twas all well beat on the grass, and turned and put down again afore we went to bed. I ripped and sewed over two of them long breaths. I ain't had such a good night's sleep for two years.' "'There!' "'What do you think of having such a mother like that for an eighty-six-year-old?' said Mrs. Todd, standing before us like a large figure of victory. As for the mother, she took on a sudden look of youth. You felt as if she promised a great future, and was beginning, not ending, her summers in their happy toils. "'My, my!' exclaimed Mrs. Todd. "'I couldn't have done it myself. I got to own it. I was much pleased to have it off my mind, said Mrs. Blackett, humbly, the more so because at the first of the next week I wasn't doing very well. I suppose it must have been the change of weather. Mrs. Todd could not resist a significant glance at me, but with charming sympathy she forbore to point the lesson or to connect this illness with its apparent cause. She loomed larger than ever in the little old-fashioned best room, with its few pieces of good furniture and pictures of national interest. The green paper curtains were stamped with conventional landscapes of a foreign order, castles on inaccessible crags, and lovely lakes with steep wooded shores. Underfoot the treasured carpet was covered thick with homemade rugs. There were empty glass lamps, and crystallized bouquets of grass and some fine shells on the narrow mantelpiece. "'I was married in this room,' said Mrs. Todd unexpectedly, and I heard her give a sigh after she had spoken, as if she could not help the touch of regret that would forever come with all her thoughts of happiness. "'We stood right there between the windows,' she added, and the minister stood there. William wouldn't come in. He was always odd about seeing folks, just as he is now. I run to meet him from a child, and William, he'd take and run away. I've been the gainer, said the old mother cheerfully. William has been son and daughter both since you was married off the island. He's been most too satisfied to stop at home long as his old mother, but I always tell him I'm the gainer. We were all moving toward the kitchen as if by common instinct. The best room was too suggestive of serious occasions, and the shades were all pulled down to shut out the summer light and air. It was indeed a tribute to society to find a room set apart for her behest there on so apparently neighborless and remote an island. Afternoon visits and evening festivals must be few in such a bleak situation at certain seasons of the year. But Mrs. Blackett was one of those who do not live to themselves, and who have long since passed the line that divides mere self-concern from a valued share in whatever society can give and take. There were those of her neighbors who had never taken the trouble to furnish a best room, but Mrs. Blackett was one who knew the uses of a parlor. Yes. "'Do come right down into the old kitchen. I shan't make any stranger of you,' she invited us pleasantly, after we had been properly received in the room anointed to its formality. "'I expect Almeria'll be drifting out amongst the pasture-weeds quick as she can find a good excuse. "'Tis hot now, 
You'd better content yourselves till you get nice and rested, and long after dinner the sea breeze will spring up, and then you can take your walks and go up and see the prospect from the big ledge. Now Muriel want to show off everything there is, and then I'll get a good cup of tea before you start to go home. The days are plenty long now. While we were talking in the best room, the selected fish had been mysteriously brought up from the shore, and lay all cleaned and ready in an earthen crock on the table. "'I think William might have just stopped on,' said a word, remarked Mrs. Todd, pouting with high affront as she caught sight of it. "'He's friendly enough when he comes ashore, and was remarkable social the last time, for him. He ain't disposed to be very social with the ladies, explained William's mother, with a delightful glance at me, as if she counted upon my friendship and tolerance. He's very particular. And he's all in his old fishing clothes today. He'll want me to tell him everything you said and done, after you've gone. William has a very deep affections, and he'll want to see you, I'll marry. Yes, I guess he'll be in by and by. "'I'll search for him by and by if he don't,' proclaimed Mrs. Todd, with an air of unalterable resolution. "'I know all of his burrows down along the shore. I'll catch him by hand, before he knows it. I've got some business with William, anyway. I brought forty-two cents with me that was due him for the last lobsters he brought in.' "'You can leave it with me,' suggested the little old mother, who was already stepping about among the pots and pans in the pantry, and preparing to make the chowder.' I became possessed of a sudden unwanted curiosity in regard to William, and felt that half the pleasure of my visit would be lost if I did not make his interesting acquaintance. So ends Chapter 8, Green Island.